They think about them. If you look at some names, uh, all of these are orthos, inscopata, uh, orthos, uh, subquadrata. Uh, we don't call them that anymore. The genus name, the first name there, has usually been changed after further study over many years. And uh, you will, if you get these Cincinnati fossil books, look for the species name and uh, look at the picture, and you'll probably say, okay, now I'm going to find what the modern name is of that same fossil. But if you're in doubt what your fossil is, you want a real good picture, this is the volume to get. Uh, another series of publications was put out by the U.S. Geological Survey. Let's see, let's try that. Uh, the, it, it is uh, series number 1066. And there's a series of uh, individual papers that go from A, and you can see this is A for G, but they actually go through A through, I think it is uh, P, which is the one on uh, cephalopods. Uh, this particular volume has uh, an overview of the uh, uh, paleontology of Kentucky and nearby states, which I hope we qualify. It's the Cincinnati uh, series. Uh, there is one, the second one, and I'm going to kind of stick with brachiopods throughout my showing you what's in these. This one's on uh, Platystrophia uh, genera. Uh, it has uh, descriptions. Uh, well, we'll start off with a general description of the type of fossils, who uh, first described them, uh, where they're found, and then it goes into specific uh, descriptions on, for instance, Platystrophia. Latacosta. I like uh, this discussion. Uh, the entire range of forms normally referred to by most workers as either Platystrophia latacosta, unicosta, or cypha comprises a highly variable group having numerous intermediaries that are sometimes difficult to identify with any degree of confidence. Uh, actually, I've, I've got three publications on Platystrophia. They all make that comment. And the, the, it, it, someone had asked the question last time, you know, is this a latacosta? My answer is that the experts can't tell. They're looking at the type species. Put a lot of cost on your label. Who's going to who's going to say it is? So, uh, and then this particular one then has, of course, plates with uh, numerous actual photographs of, in this case, Platystrophia, and there is descriptions that go with them. Each plate uh, in this particular one volume that has the extra. Uh, or three or four together, it has one on trilobites, uh, paper on trilobites, you see some Beautiful. pictures. Theory of pairs. Uh, there is one on uh, Edrios, and I think there's one on just plain asteroids. Yeah, for asteroids. Yeah. That's, that's the one volume, but there are other volumes. Uh, each one came out separately. Here, for instance, that's correct. This, this is the one on Hebertella. Is that right? Yeah, now it's. Now it is. Now it is, okay. It's Hebertella. Okay. And uh, again, this is M. The, 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 uh, again, you've got the same type of stuff uh, a general description, an introduction telling you who first described it. And then you've got in the back the, uh, the photographs. And you'll notice uh, Hypertella occidentalis. And then you've got the, the illustrations. So if you want to get a little more in depth and get a good description of your fossil, you try to figure out what you have, these are the type of publications you need. Cincinnati series uh, put out by Paleontologic America. Well, anyway, this one uh, is a fairly rare one, but it's, it's trace fossils of the Cincinnati area. Uh, put out by uh, Richard Osgood. It's uh, difficult to get a hold of, but if you can, it's, it's uh, very, very thorough. Uh, has a lot of uh, diagrams related to the trace fossils. You can see those. Uh, has very interesting 
cellophane sheets that show with and without the traces going on a particular, in this case, trilobite uh, tracks. There's several of those in here. And then, of course, it has actual photographs of the trace fossils you find in the Cincinnati area and uh, the explanation of what they are. As John mentioned, uh, those of us who collect in this area are particularly lucky. And we outlined some essential books. Uh, the Cincinnati Fossils book, Exploring the Geology of Cincinnati, The Sea Without Fish. The authors of these three essential volumes are in this room tonight. That is something that not many uh, clubs can talk about on a monthly basis. So once you've gone through the essential materials and you've gotten the basics of the paleontology and the geology of this area, then it's time to start stretching, to start moving your knowledge forward and applying it in ways that you can as an amateur. And one of the ways that you do that is by moving into a different realm of books. Has anyone ever brought a fossil to identify to the identification booth at the GeoFair? Okay. I can tell you from years sitting at that, that table that this is the book that gets the biggest workout. <laughs> when, uh, when somebody brings something in and we're, we're working a shift at the identification booth and it's out of the Cincinnati area, if it's a, in an unusual form, something like that, you can pretty much guarantee that the ID booth is going to pull this book out as their first shot at trying to identify what's going on. The Index Fossils of North America is a book that was put together uh, some time ago to track the kinds of fossils that are unique to specific geologic layers and to identify, help uh, people in the field identify those specimens so that they get an idea of the strata that they're working on. As a consequence, it covers pretty much the geology or the paleontology of uh, North America. It's very detailed, rather technical. It's, uh, it's got a, um, um, a clear uh, professional bent. When I talk to people who are using this for the first time, almost invariably they're confused by the illustrations not exactly matching up with the text on the opposite page. <laughs> you, you have to do a little hunting to find the description for the illustration that you're seeing. But it is worth uh, the effort. It's, it uh, gives you uh, the sort of technical description of the specimens that the other books we're talking about try to make easy for you to identify. It gets into some detail to really clarify um, exactly how you can tell this specific index fossil. It's very helpful as an education to, to learn the specific technical terms for parts of fossils. Uh, it is a, um, a very helpful work to really understanding how species are identified uh, among extinct populations. I've got a good friend who's um, a limnologist, um, uh, a biologist in other words, and he, uh, he always makes fun of me identifying species. He wants to know how I breed these fossils uh, to find out whether they're species or not. But this book really helps you understand how species are identified. What, what comment? That book also has an index both by species and by genera. Right. Uh, if you get this old volume I was talking about where they've changed all the genera, you can look up the species in index fossils and it'll refer you to the page and then you can see what the current, or at least current when it was printed, the genera name was. And the person who did the Cincinnati fossils stole the idea of an index from species names and from generic names from Shimer and Shrub. Okay. <laughs> the, um, he was referring to himself. Another way to expand your knowledge 
and John alluded to this with uh, some of the historic uh, publications he has, is to understand how we arrived at the state of knowledge we have today. And that can be accomplished by looking back at some of the historic summaries or surveys of uh, the geology and paleontology of this area. One of the ones that, uh, one of the books that, that gives you some good insight into how the geology and paleontology of Cincinnati was understood early in the 1900s is Nevin Fenneman's Geology of Cincinnati and Vicinity. Uh, 